I do. I mean, there are many different ways of looking at this. Uh, the sort of instinctive way is we go, well, mass surveillance still exists. Uh, so nothing changed. We didn't fix the problem, right? But this is a little bit of a misunderstanding about why I came forward. I didn't come forward to tell people how to live or what to do. Uh, the problem of 2013 was not one specifically of surveillance, but one of democracy. It was the fact that our laws had changed. The operation of our governments had changed around the world, across borders, and it had happened without our knowledge, without our consent. Now, the basic principle of democracy uh, in an open Western liberal society, one would hope at least, is that the government governs uh, because they have a mandate that's based on the consent of the governed. If we don't know what's going on, we can't give our consent. Now, this isn't to say that we need to know the operations of uh, every single program, that we need to know the names of every terrorist target. No one thinks we do. But when we're substituting the judgment of a very few people behind closed doors, this is actually changing the boundaries of our rights. Uh, it's reshaping the way that uh, our governments operate, our militaries operate, uh, even our police in our ordinary communities operate. Uh, in the United States, this is becoming uh, very apparent because surveillance capabilities that once were the exclusive preserve uh, of the top intelligence agencies of the world, I'm talking about CIA, NSA, uh, and so on, have trickled down to the fact that regular police now are using them and they're concealing them from courts, uh, saying that they have a confidential informant that says they found this suspect or they think this person did that or the other. Uh, but in reality, it's a surveillance system that's doing this. It's spying that's doing this. So the primary way that things have changed is that now we know. And now we sort of broadly, the public, at least have a chance to express our feelings. We have a chance to vote. We have a chance to debate uh, where the boundaries should really be about this. Uh, this isn't about being for or against surveillance. Uh, this is about being for citizens and citizens' rights. Ultimately, I think It's not enough for us to live uh, in a country uh, where we accept a government. Uh, we can live with the government. We should be partner to government. And I think this is something increasingly that people are beginning to feel a little bit of a disconnect about. Uh, but when we see what's going on, uh, when the government trusts us, uh, the public, to have sort of a role in this conversation, we see that things start to change. Uh, in March of 2013, three months before I came forward and gave that first interview to The Guardian, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, was hearing a case about these mass surveillance programs that had been alleged to exist by human rights organizations. But the court said, you can't prove this surveillance exists. Therefore, even though these programs seem to be unlawful, even though this seems to be something that uh, the court should have a say uh, in determining whether this program should continue, uh, the government can simply say it's secret and the court must accept the government's claim. After June of 2013, after that first uh, interview, the courts reheard the case and they ruled against the government uh, restricting the surveillance powers of the intelligence community in the United States for the first time in more than 40 years. The president of the United States, who originally was against these programs or uh, against this publication, this journalism, uh, said, in fact, this debate has made us stronger as a nation while he can't condone what I did. And the Congress itself that, uh, you know, initially very aggressively responded and called me uh, a terrorist and a traitor and many other things, uh, they themselves passed a new law uh, codifying sort of the guidance of the courts. 
We've seen this in a few countries. Uh, we've seen some positive progress in uh, the interpretation of uh, international law and how that applies to sort of treaties and agreements. For example, uh, the Safe Harbor Agreement uh, was struck down on the basis of the U.S. intelligence uh, community's powers, the way the laws are written, uh, provided no meaningful protections for EU citizens. And yet a paradigm had been provided uh, that allowed uh, companies to take data about the lives of EU citizens and pass them to U.S. companies where they receive no protection. Uh, unfortunately, that's the case today. But I, I guess what I want to say there is just, it's very easy to think that nothing's changed, but it is changing. It's not changing fast enough. We haven't done enough and the problem isn't solved, but now we have a place to start. 